Church. Again, I'm Pastor Chris Myros. We are so glad that you are here with us today. If you haven't been here, I've been working for the last few weeks through uh, some of the famous Christmas carols. And today I want to talk to you um, about some truth from God's Word, but some truth that we also find in one of these carols uh, from the carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. A great little carol. Um, I'm going to be referencing a number of Bible verses. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the chairs in front of you. You can use your iPhone, an iPad. If you've got Android, um, any of those, I recommend the U version of the Bible. Um, it's a great little app. It works on your computer, works on your phone, works on your iPad. If it, if it plugs in and has electricity, it probably works on it. It's a great little option for you to use there. And so uh, feel free to grab that. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles for you to take home for free. They're gifts. They're on the Welcome Center. They're light blue. If you don't have a Bible, take one, please. It's on us. We would like to bless you with that. But we're going to dig in here on O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and then I'm going to continue while I'm talking. Pray that I don't have a coughing fit. I've doubled up on my cough medicine, so I think I'm good. We'll see. But the one word, as we're studying O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the one word that's going to describe our whole message today is the word Emmanuel. Now, if you've been in the church, not a new word to you, but an important word. And if you're taking notes, if you don't know what it means, the word Emmanuel simply means God with us, right? Now, I'm curious, how many of you have ever perhaps prayed, God be with me, or, or, or God at least be with us, right? How many of you have ever prayed something like that? Like, like maybe you were about to go on a trip, and you said, God be with us, let us travel safely. Bring us your travel mercies, right? I pray, God, that we arrive there safely and that the kids would be behaved and that we wouldn't kill them on the drive there because they're going to drive us nuts, right? I remember my dad had like the super arm, right? My brother, we, when I was a young kid, we had a 77 Pontiac Ventura. Looked like the Nova. It was the Pontiac version, right? And uh, my dad was the master of 75 and whap, 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 whap. Didn't even take his eyes off the road, and yet he could find you every time. I don't, it's like his arm had radar. I have no idea, but he would find you in that back seat. And it was like his shoulder was double jointed because I was behind him and he'd still get me. Man, right? How many of you have prayed, yeah, God be with us like that? Or, you know, any, anything of that nature. God be with us. It's, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday. We, we went up to Duluth yesterday and I pulled into the mall parking lot, which is insanity, of course, the couple, the day before Christmas Eve. And, uh, so I pull into this parking lot and it's cars as far as you can see. And immediately my first prayer is dear Jesus, find me a front row parking spot, please. <laughs> you know, cause it was cold in Duluth yesterday. Holy smokes. You know, so I'm praying, bring us this front row. Or maybe, anybody ever been on a blind date? I've been on a couple, right? That'll cause you to pray. Dear Lord, I pray he's not psycho, right? Be with me. Yeah. I'm sure the girls were praying that about me at the very least. Or if you're a student, right? Here's one we've all prayed. Lord, be with me in this test. And I can always imagine God in heaven going, Sure would have been a lot easier if you would have just studied, right? Yeah, God expects you to study. He'll help. He'll be with you, but you still need to study. What does it mean for God to be with us? And I want to read it to you from Matthew 21 here. Matthew's version of the birth of Christ. He talks about the Virgin Mary and he says, She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now this was an announcement that, that the people, the Jewish people, had been longing to hear for centuries, right? And Matthew comes and he makes this announcement. And, and I mean, this is, this is the good news of the gospel. This is what the whole story of the Bible is about. And then he goes on in verse 22 and he says, All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. Well, let's pause there. What Matthew's about to do is he's, he's, he's pointing back into the Old Testament, right? To the prophet Isaiah, if you don't know which prophet he's talking about. This comes from Isaiah 7.14. 
And, and there the prophet Isaiah, some 740 years before the time of Jesus, 740 years before the event of the birth of Jesus even begins to take place, this happens, this prophecy. Now, I don't know about you, but 740 years is a long time, right? To have a prophecy that is this accurate. Uh, at least for me, it, it amazes me. Uh, I'm blown away by how good and amazing and, and clear and specific in this instance that God is. How big God is. That, that over seven centuries before Jesus was ever born, this prophecy was made and now it's being fulfilled. In verse 23 it says this, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, if this was a movie, at this point in the movie, it's, this would be like that real dramatic time, right? Where, where the music goes, dun, 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 you know, like trumpets and everything going off. Because this is a big announcement. This is a proclamation. This is a big deal. He's called Emmanuel. God with us. If you were a Jew, there's nothing better that you could have heard. This was earth-shattering news. Everybody who was listening, everybody who would have read this, everybody, all of the people would have known these Old Testament prophecies. And then to hear that God was going to be with us, it would have been like, whoa. Hold on a second, right? How many of you have seen those Indiana Jones movies, right? There's the one where they open the Ark of the Covenant and everybody's faces melt off, right? It's kind of gross, kind of cool. Well, that was kind of the fear of the Jews, right? You could not look upon God. Moses hid his face when he was in the presence of God because he was not worthy to see God. You see, Moses was a sinner. Moses was tainted. Moses was, was broken. And the broken cannot see the perfect. The imperfect cannot be with the holy. They cannot be together. And so when the Bible tells us, Emmanuel, God is going to be with us, the Jews would have been like, Whoa, hold on a second. Are our faces going to melt off? Not really, but this is a big deal. God is going to be with us? Us? Does he know who we are? Our history? I mean, they knew God could dwell in the temple, right? And once a year, and only once a year could the high priest, after some significant ritual cleansing, to make sure he was clean and pure and holy in that moment, only then could that priest go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence there where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God was, manifested physically upon earth in the Old Testament. Now suddenly Matthew is saying he's going to be with us? This is what makes the shepherds run back to their fields Rejoicing, right? This is what caused the wise men to come and bow down before a baby. Bow down in worship. It was this fact and this fact alone that God is not distant, that God is not far off, that God is not an uninvolved God. That God is not somehow just some God who kind of watches over us as some, you know, like, like he was the divine watchmaker. He built this beautiful clock and he cranked it up and he let it go. Now he's not involved. No. The creator God, the sovereign God, the sustainer of all of the universe is a relational God who, who stripped himself of glory and, and became like us as man in the form of of a baby who was all God yet all man without sin who dwelt on earth with us 
The Apostle John in John 1 1 says this. One of, in my opinion, one of the two most important verses in all the Bible. If you only know two verses of the Bible, Genesis 1 and John 1, learn those. Okay? And in John 1 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and it became flesh. And then later it says, and he dwelt among us. All of a sudden, Matthew is going to say this, God is with you. God was with you. And God will be with you. But, the reality of life, the truth of the matter is, it doesn't, it doesn't always feel like God is with us, does it? If we're honest. Maybe you're in a tough spot. Maybe life isn't going exactly like you'd like it to. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Christmas is a great magnifier, right? Christmas magnifies the good and Christmas magnifies the bad. If things are going really good, then Christmas is really, really good. If things aren't going the best, then Christmas really isn't all that grand. And so it can magnify the painful times and make them seem a little extra painful. I mean, maybe this year you're going to sit down and have lunch tomorrow and there's going to be an empty chair. Somebody you deeply loved was there last year or the year before or ten years ago. Somebody you wish that was there but isn't. Maybe it's a relational problem, divorce, death, distance, whatever it might be. But you feel that loss and it hurts and it it wrecks you even. Maybe it's just that relational tension with the people that are actually in those chairs, right? Sometimes that's it. Maybe you've been there. And seeing those big Christmas blowouts where people quit talking to one another afterwards, right? That happens. Maybe it's just some bad news about a health issue. Or whatever it is. But you're going through it and you're going, you know what? Where is God in all of this? Right? Right? I mean, I don't feel God. I I don't see God. If God is there, what's going on here? Where is God in this? God, God is with me? I mean, some of you, if you were really honest, you would say, yeah, I've done stuff in my life I'm ashamed of. God doesn't feel close. Why would God want to be with like somebody like me? God with me? I mean, that can be really hard to believe, can't it? Well, here's my goal for today. Before we're through, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you will be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is and that God was and God will always be with you because he is Emmanuel, God with us. And when God plants that truth into your heart, I'm here to tell you, you will never, ever be the same again. Let's break it down with three thoughts. The first one is this, if you're following along in your notes, simply, that God is with you. This comes from Luke 1.28. In Luke 1.28, an angel appears, comes to this, this young virgin teenage girl, and he says, greetings, right? We got a polite angel today. Greetings. Although I imagine angels. If God has the voice of Morgan Freeman, what does an angel sound like? Those are the things that keep me up at night. I don't know about you. But the angel comes and he says, greetings, you who are most highly favored. The Lord is with you, Mary. The Lord is with you. The very first truth that the angel proclaims to this girl is what she needed to know. Because, you see, 
this angel's about to unload some serious information. He's going to tell her something that is both going to be difficult to believe, but even more difficult to live. So the angel of the Lord arrives and says, Hey Mary, nice to see you. The Lord is with you. Now, if you are one of those people who's hurting today, brokenhearted, maybe you feel lonely, maybe it's relational strife, whatever it is, I want you to understand that the Lord is with you in an even more powerful way. Because the scripture says that our God is the God of comfort, who comforts us in our trials. The root of the Greek word that's translated as comfort is a word, parakletos. Para means alongside of. We use paraprofessionals in our schools, right? The paraprofessionals come alongside and they help students. So para means alongside. And the kleto means called to. You see, our God comes alongside of you. He is called to minister to you in your times of trouble. Paracleto, comfort. He is called to comfort us when we have great need. Again, many people uh, simply put, don't, don't believe that. They don't believe that God is sent to comfort. Instead, they, they, they think God is out to get them. God's out to punish them. God is waiting for them to fail or screw up so he can get them, right? Throw some lightning bolts down from heaven. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the Jesus that we worship. And I tell you, if you would come to know Jesus as Lord, you would know his comfort, his peace, and it would change everything. Now here's the thing. When you understand that the God of the universe, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the ever-present God, that that God is with you, it changes everything. When you are lost, when you don't know what, where to go, you, you, you don't know who to turn to, He's there to be your guide. When you're hurting, when you're feeling alone, when it feels like you don't have a whole lot of hope left, Jesus is there as your friend. When you're in the middle of a trial, when life's not going the way you thought it was supposed to be, our God is there to be our comforter. If you are sick, He is your healer. Whenever you are weak, the Bible says He will be your strength. When you are lost in your sin, our God is with you as your Savior. That is why we worship. Point number two. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Simply this. Our God was with us. When you look back over your lifetime, it's a lot easier to see God in the rear view mirror, isn't it? Right? I know it certainly is in my life. I can see God's fingerprints all over my life where in the moment, right now, it's sometimes hard to see. And you can look back over the series of your life and the, the life events that you've experienced and you can see God all over it. A great example of that out of Scripture is a guy by the name of Joseph. Not Joseph and Mary Joseph, but Old Testament Joseph, right? You've heard this story, many of you, if you've been in church. Different Joseph than the New Testament Joseph. Joseph, if you don't know his story, Joseph at, at one time was a, a young boy with big, big dreams. And Joseph says, hey, I'm going to be the leader, right? And his brothers, they looked at him and said, you're a punk and you're cocky. We don't like you. 
Literally. Well, not exact words, but it was Hebrew. They didn't like him. He was a brat. And so what do his brothers do? His brothers beat him up. They throw him in a pit. And, and originally, the brothers are like, yeah, let's just leave him for dead. But one of the nice brothers go, nah, we don't want to do that. Let's sell him into slavery. Nice brothers, right? You think you got bad siblings. I mean, come on. Look at these guys. So they sell him into slavery. That's exactly what they did. Go home and tell dad, oh yeah, lion, animal, something killed him. Here's the coat. Right? Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat. Now, despite all of that happening in his life, Joseph lived with integrity. Yet, if you, if you follow his story, Joseph then is falsely accused of something he didn't do and ends up getting thrown into prison. Now, if you're looking at the story from a distance, his brothers beat him up, they threw him in a pit, they th- sold him into slavery, he's lied about, he's put into prison. Right? Where is God in all of this? And so you have to see the story over the course of his whole life to realize that God was still, at, even in these times of trial, working behind the scenes. You could say that that pit that Joseph was thrown into becomes the passage eventually to the palace. Because you see, if you follow that story, what happens is eventually he gets out of prison. And eventually he gets to become kind of the second in command over the entire nation of Egypt. Directly beneath Pharaoh. And by being put in charge and being entrusted into this place, he is able to save millions of people's lives, including the lives of all those scoundrel brothers of his who would beat him and sold him into slavery. Genesis 39.21 says this. tells us exactly where God was. The Bible says this. The Lord was with Joseph. That's where he was throughout the whole story. When you look back, he was there. When things were grim, there was God. And I'm amazed too when I look back over my life, right? And see all the different times that God was with me. Times where I had more bills than I had money. But God provided. Health issues, relationship issues, loss of jobs. Uh, We've been there. And in the middle of it, man, it could feel so hard. It can be really hard to see God in it, right? But yet when I look back on my life, God's fingerprints are everywhere, all over my life. Unmistakably so. I made it today solely because of His grace. I'm still standing here today, moving forward in life, because God was with me. God is with us. Let me close with this third and final point. If you're taking notes, it's simply this. God will be with you. No matter what you're going through, God will be with you. I want you to think about this. You got this little girl, Mary, right? Teenage girl. Imagine, imagine for a moment if she knew what God had in store for her. Not quite like that song, but Mary, did you know? I have no voice, so I can't sing, which is probably not my excuse because I just can't sing. But Mary, did you know, right? Can you imagine, Mary? What God has in store for you. An unwed mother in that culture. A child effectively born in a barn, in a cave. Right? Raising a family as teenagers. But not only that, the responsibility 
of raising the Son of God. Man, I worry about screwing up with my kid. Can you imagine having the Son of God? And then, can you imagine losing the Son of God? Because, hey, that's one of the first stories in the Bible. Joseph and Mary are walking home one day, and they're like, Have you seen Jesus? No. I thought you had him. No? Uh-oh. Anybody seen Jesus? Well, they got to walk a, a day's walk back into town to go find Jesus. Of course, they find him. He's sitting at the temple like... like Riffing with the rabbi. But there was a lot of pressure there, right? And as he grows, he begins to heal the sick and the lame. She sees him cast out demons. She watches him as he turns water into wine. This is the Jesus who calmed the storms. This is the Jesus who walked on water. She didn't know her future, but God was with her through all of it. The good and the bad. He was there. And when things looked their darkest, Jesus rose from the grave and he conquered sin. He conquered death. Because he is Emmanuel. Because he is God with us. Because he is the God who was and is and will be with us no matter what the apostle Paul said it this way Paul asks the question he says this in Romans 8 35, 37, 38, 39 Paul says who shall separate us from the love of God from the love of Christ shall trouble no shall hardship no How about persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. How about danger? No. Sword? No, no, no. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor powers, neither heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Understand this. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You will never be alone. Nothing can separate you. Not your fears, not your doubts, not your insecurities, not your theological questions, not the things that you can't explain, not your brokenness, not your failures, not your mistakes, not your sickness, not a divorce, not something else someone did to you, not your broken dreams, not something you did to someone else. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Because he is, he was, and he will be with you. Revelations 1.8, Jesus said, I am the Alpha, the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who was and the one who is to come, the God who is with you, who was with you, and who is with you forever. He is with us, folks, and there is no question whatsoever. It is settled And it is written. He is Emmanuel. God with you. There is no doubt. Leave here today knowing God is with you. God is for you. And that God does love you. He is Emmanuel. He wants to reveal his love to you. His character. His nature. His goodness. He wants to be in relationship with you. And He wants you in return to be in relationship with Him. He wants you to love Him with all of your heart, with all your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Because He's not a far off, distant God who's uninvolved, but He is a relational God who came to earth to reveal Himself to you and to me and to forgive us of our sins so that we could know Him, so that we could serve Him, and so that we 
could have eternal life. That is why we celebrate Christmas. Merry Christmas. Let's pray.